It is 1 o'clock and we are starting the school board workshop for facilities update, surplus property, and naming procedures for new schools. Thank you. Have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the board. Um, this afternoon, we prepared a uh, very lengthy facilities uh, presentation, um, but our, our intention is to give you a complete overview of um, what we think are the highlights in the facilities department, we're going to focus on the uh, our design and construction program update, um, construction market conditions, some project budget updates, um, a real estate update which Mr. Callan will be um, taking us through, and then uh, an update from uh, our legal company. So, if I could, I'll begin, um, uh, get right into the design and construction update. Uh, just wanted to provide an overview of the entire design and construction program to the board. Um, we have five projects in, in planning, 26 projects in design and 31 in construction for a uh, whopping total of about $919 million. Um, there is a further breakdown in the projects in planning that we have, uh, like Pontiana High School and Celebration K-8. These are going to go directly into design if the board approves um, our work authorizations tonight for design services. So we're pushing ahead with that and we have roughly about $20 million in planning. Um, design's kind of heavy, but we reduced this significantly because we put a lot of our projects into construction, but the largest one in design is the new high school, which we currently have on the street for uh, our bids. Um, we're taking bids, our construction manager is doing that. Um, I'll provide an update on the Rome, the project over in Rome Bridge, KADD. Um, that design was completed. That project was pushed one year, but we do have um, some challenges with our uh, developer pro uh, delivering that site to us. And then we are knee deep in the design for uh, OXA and Mini Creek, and then we have a couple of smaller projects. Um, we do have 19 miscellaneous projects, so you do have a handout members of the board that shows a complete breakdown of all of the projects. That's just for information purposes. We don't, uh, unless you need to discuss something specific, but wanted to make sure that you had a list of every single project with their budgets and schedules in your hand. Now, the only question I have on this slide yes, is sir. the OXA comprehensive innovation is budgeted at 57 million. The gateway was 100 and something million. I don't know if that's a realistic estimation of what it will cost to renovate. So currently, that's a very fair question. So we felt like we do, we had a good budget, and as we get further into budget updates, I'll, I'll talk you through that. The only thing that's a surprise right now that might potentially impact our budget is the amount of work that's needed to be done on the auditorium itself. We found more structural damage than we thought um, we would because of the age of the building, but we don't expect a major update to the budget. Mr. Melendez, our design and our construction managers, our design professionals and our construction managers feel like our budget um, that we advertised with was sufficient for the job. I don't, I don't mean to question it, but because on the next slide, Gateway High School was 103 million versus 57. That's not like a little bit off. But Gateway was a, was it, what do you call it, a Castaldi? Correct. So yeah. we did we didn't knock down a lot of buildings and rebuild, plus we did renovate. So OXA has all portables that are going to be moved. Those are a separate project right now that are going to be moved out this summer. We do have temporary portables in place. And then we're building a new classroom wing. Then we get into renovating what is essentially the offices and the auditorium spaces um, that are that are core buildings. So it's a, it's a completely new building, so it's mostly new construction. The site work is not as significant. We do have a parking lot and, and a bus loop, 
but they're not. Uh, Oxa is being built for 1,250 students compared to Gateway for like about 2,500 students. So that alone should translate. Yeah, and the only reason why I bring it up is because if we're that far off, in reality, then something else has to slide. You know what I'm saying? So if we're, if we're off by 10 million, that's not a big deal. But I'm looking at $50 million difference. $50 million means something in here is going to get done. So but if it's you, not, it's it depends on scope and but that's the question I'm asking, though. That's the reason why. Understood. And I question it, because staff may say it, but I don't think, that, again, because that's, and then you got to consider inflation costs and everything else. Correct. The scopes are completely different. They, they are. And, and Mr. Melendez, the GMB, the actual construction contract for Gateway was about $84 million. The, we carried a lot of money, which we cut back significantly on for because we were in the middle of escalations and stuff like that, where prices were changing pretty much every 30 days. I think we've kind of got through that period right now. We do have some updates on what the market is doing, but the actual construction contract for Gateway was about $84 million, $83, $84 million. So, That's a starting point. Understood. And, and, and so, yes, fair point. We are assessing that. We're very early in our scope validation um, process. But again, our construction manager and our architect both felt like we had a reasonable budget and we weren't looking at significant impacts to it. Okay. So slide seven is our, uh, there are our projects in construction. Um, uh, as you will notice, we have f about $508 million in construction. It's a lot of work that's happening. So Gateway High School, and I have photographs of all of these large projects uh, further on my presentation. So I'll take you, show you, um, take you through that to show you how we're progressing. The largest obvious, obviously is Gateway High School, which we're expecting to wrap up completely. We have full occupancy of Gateway right now. Um, we're working on the courtyard, which is the last piece to be done, and then we back out of there this summer. That project will be 100% completed. Um, and then we just broke ground on K8 uh, BB, which is the project over in the Kindred subdivision. Um, sorry, K8 AA, which is the Kindred subdivision. Um, BB and CC, which is uh, Poinciana off of Poinciana by the Knightsbridge subdivision and in Sunbridge, both of these projects are targeted for opening this summer as well as um, the New City Phase 2 and St. Cloud High School Classroom Edition. Um, we have a multitude of smaller projects which are HVAC, kitchen renovations, um, and uh, parking projects that we are working on or are in the process of wrapping up. Uh, we, we have a very heavy lift this summer. Um, but everything looks good. Um, we are trying to um, mitigate all of our material delays, if any, that we're seeing, um, but we look to be in good shape. Uh, slide number eight, we, we created a new project map. Our old one um, kind of been there for a while, but it shows you how the projects are, the large projects, all of our large projects are spread out across the district. You have Ox at the very um, top, and you have some <coughs> all the way over um, to the right, as well as the new high school AAA, which we're building. In the far left, you have the Transportation West facility, which is in which we have officially put in construction, but I do need to update the board on some issues that we are running into with permits. So the next few slides are, you know, very pretty pictures, but I can take you through them to show you our areas. Uh, as you can see in Gateway, uh, pretty much all those gray buildings in the center of the um, courtyard those have all been demolished, so we pretty much are done with our demolition now and started to build a courtyard. That's the last part of this. A lot of the portables have been pulled out by our maintenance department. So you're starting to see that reduction in rental portables over Gateway because we have occupancy of all the classroom buildings. Um, we have renovated the ninth grade center that the admin was in temporarily for a while and we've turned that back over into classrooms. Um, and we are wrapping up the construction on their new ROTC Gun, well, ROTC, ROTC shooting range. So we, we should wrap that up in the next couple of weeks and turn that over. But the contractor has pretty much uh, demobilized their construction trailer. They're in a small office in the build, one of the buildings and they backed out. They're pretty much back out there. We're, um, the next couple of slides show you some uh, photographs and um, of what the front looks like. Uh, of course, we've done quite a few tours of here of this. We've hosted our BAB um, uh, meeting over there uh, in the media center um, two meetings ago. New gymnasium, uh, parking areas, new media center, um, school loves it, I think. They're starting to use their new auditorium and their gym, so they're back up and running um, the way that they should be. Slide number 13 shows you the project um, over on Ponciana Boulevard, which is KABB. Um, uh, this project's in good shape. We did have 
our DOAS, which is our dedicated outside air system, it's a part of the HVAC system. That's delayed. We were expecting it to show up this week. We've gotten updates from our, our suppliers. But other than that, um, all of the paving is done. This is a lot further along than it is. The grass is going on. The track is, is paved already. Our parking areas are done, bus loops. Um, we're, uh, all the flooring is done. So the other slide, slide 14, shows you what our car loop is. And you know, I have to point out, this car loop can hold 225 cars on site. Um, and it's one of the challenges that we have every time we get into one of these construction projects, but we are doing the best we can with the property we have, we can acquire. Um, slide 15 shows you the, another uh, angle from where the, the track is, and that's already um, paved. Slide 16 shows you an in the inside of a classroom. We went out the, the black that you see on the floor is actually temporary covering because the permanent floor is down. We're just protecting it as we start moving ff &E and e and, and started doing our punch list and stuff over the next um, few weeks. The ceiling tiles, where we're wrapping up our above ceilings, we just, all that's left for us to do is to drop the ceiling tiles in, so we're in good shape. Slide 17 shows you the gymnasium. Um, this is a lot further along. We're working on um, finishing up the flooring, and uh, the photograph to the right of slide 17 is looking at the stage and the cafeteria. Slide 18 is an aerial for the project over in the Sunbridge subdivision, which is K8CC. Um, uh, paving is happening right now. We did have a lot of base. They, they scheduled this project differently, so their track is done. They were already putting down the grass. Um, and they were in a similar shape like, like the K8BB, which is the nice bridge uh, project. Above ceiling inspections are happening. We have um, uh, slide 19 shows you a hallway that's completed. Lights are in. We're just wrapping up our above ceiling inspections and dropping ceiling tiles. How many acres is that site? That is about 25. 25. 20, 25. Just five, shy of 25 acres. All, all within those bounds, or does that include those retention areas? It does not. It's just just our property. So the, 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 the just where the fencing is, that's, that's it. Um, this project does not have retention on site. As part of acquiring this site, we put in the contract that they will accommodate our storm water. Uh, slide 19 shows you our, our kitchen cooler freezers are, are installed. Um, we're working on flooring. So from the time we put together our presentation, especially this time of the year, significant amounts of work are done over, um, over a week or two. So th these are a lot further along. Um, I do have to mention that we do have our switch gear, which has been a challenge on previous projects, showed up for both of these projects, um, as well as New City. Um, St. Cloud High School is all buttoned up, pretty much they're probably going to be done in a month um, and turn that building over to us. So we're, um, we're in very good shape from an electrical standpoint, it's just the HVAC portion that we're tracking. One part of the HVAC, so we're, we're, we have received most of the needs. Slide 21, and this was done in alphabetical order. So, um, uh, the way that we track it on our sheet. So um, it's Kindred, the, the project over in Kindred. This is a lot further along. We are pouring tilt walls. We're focusing on our foundation. I'd say probably in another uh, month or so, you're going to see that building start to come out of the ground. So um, one of the good things with pad ready sites is we can make significant progress really quickly because not a lot of site work that needs to be done. We did have some challenges, but we mitigated those. What is the acreage for this one? Hey, I have a question. Back on slide 15, on the Knightsbridge area, yeah. <clears throat> we own the land all the way to the road, right? In the corner, see where the track is? Oh, I know like, the picture kind of cuts it off. Yes, sir. But does it go across? Do we own like a little slither on, on that side? Because yeah. that's a high traffic, that's a highly trafficked area. Will we ever consider like maybe putting up like a billboard or something like that and generating extra revenue? Uh, so now that we have it on some schools, depending on where it's at. It's not something that we've been approached with. Typically, we get into billboards when someone approaches us because of the location, but it is prime location for one. Um, that entire area will be grassed, and our uh, we were always of the intention that if there, there there's an entire subdivision being built to the south of this facility to the south of this photograph Correct. um single family and, and apartment <coughs> homes um there is some low income um not low income what is the right word for that on the workforce oh, housing workforce, workforce okay. housing that's supposed to come out of by Knightsbridge as well by Knightsbridge, but this is 
No, don't talk about Knightsbridge. Yeah. No, don't talk about Knightsbridge. Because, yeah, because yeah. yeah. that's going to be like, yeah. instead of all those developments, that's just increasing. But there is, there is affordable, housing. affordable housing. Yeah, no, Mr. Menendez, it's a good approach. Yeah. I mean, it's not what we're in business for, but sometimes I know we generate revenue with cell phone towers. We have a couple of billboards. And those are nice to support the school districts when we have like out of school field trips and things like that. Just, just maximizing the space. So that, you know. we're, we're, we're open for, I mean, if we're approached, we'll certainly take that into consideration. But so coming back to site 21, um, the project over in Kindred, we think in the next few weeks we'll start, you'll start seeing the walls go up as, for that building. Slide 22, um, uh, near the second phase of Neo City, you can see the building being done. Um, it's painted on the outside, the signs are up. Um, windows are in. Slide 23 shows you the progress that's been made on the inside. There's a new kitchen cafeteria in this building that wasn't in the first. This is a full three-story, um, uh, and we have all of our parts and pieces here, so we're making we're making really good progress. I know the chair visited, um, I think yesterday, and had a tour with um, with some students from New York City as well. So it's very impressive. Yes, the kids ask good questions of the engineers out there. And, and most of our CMs are doing that now because they're working with um, uh, with our students and uh, providing tours and answering questions, trying to expose kids to um, our students to the traffic construction trade. Now, on page 22, because um, I was there on site, and, and they told us that that's owned by the county. Correct. Do we lay them here yeah. to the left. Do we want to just, what's the county going to do with it? That's right next to our school. Do we want to have like extra space there? I mean, before it gets used for something else. You know what I mean? That, that could be like a secondary parking lot, or that can be a, it, it's to the, um, if you look at the map, right, you know, this, this area to the left. It's like it's yeah. a little slip. the construction trailer. And the county owns it. Got it. And I'm just thinking, you know, I mean, before it gets too late, we go, oh, man, what if we could have just had that extra space to do something? You know what I mean? Just, just something for the board to consider that, you know, because it's right, we're using it now for construction. So imagine later on, what if we want to have like a secondary parking lot? Or if we want to, whatever, and I can't or we'll have a cool lab or, I mean, just something to consider before yeah. they Thank earmark you. it to something else. Yeah, we can definitely go ahead. We, we can certainly talk about it. Uh, so back to slide 23, you can see uh, good progress. Then slide 24 is the St. Cloud High School, um, the wing edition, 21 classrooms. So we're budding up to an existing building and adding 21 classrooms. This photograph is intended to show you can't really tell the difference in between the two. So the new construction is kind of is blended really well with the uh, yes. with the existing building, and then uh, slide 25 shows you what's happening on the inside. You have uh, <coughs> classroom ceilings being done, bathrooms being built, um, and our, our mechanical and electrical equipment ongoing. So this this is this is significantly further along than most. Um, slide 26 is the uh, transportation east project. Um, and uh, this, is, this is a lot of site work, right? This is, I think, upwards of 60, 80 acres of, of uh, site work. Um, uh, this has made a lot of progress since then. We've done a lot better in our retention ponds. Um, the building itself is precast, so just because of the size of this building, it was it was <coughs> cheaper for us to precast this off-site and bring the building on-site. So the building would actually start showing the pieces for the building would start showing up this week to be assembled. So you'll see a building coming out of the ground pretty soon. So I wanted to provide an update on uh, KADD, which is the project over in the Rhonebridge subdivision. So we we asked the board to push this project one year, and, and we accommodated that in our rezoning process last year. For the students that were intended, this was supposed to be along um, the same timeline as the project in Kindred. Um, the developer started having some really good discussions with us about delivering the site to us in August, and then suddenly they've gone quiet. Um, we do think they haven't said that to us, but I can anticipate that they have issues with their uh, wetlands permitting that is going to significantly impact the schedule for this. You'll notice that there is a big part of wetland where the track is supposed to be. Um, I, I have a slide a bit further down during construction updates, but pretty much what happened is a federal court put a stop um, on the, the, the Florida Department of Envi Environmental Protection from issuing any permits for wetland mitigation. So they put a stop to it, but never said who can go do it. And that's a part of our challenge right now, because all of our permitting was being go go was going through the state, but now there is limbo. So there is a court case that pretty much put a stop on any project that has a wetland on it. You had a permit in progress, or you're applying for a permit, you're going to be stuck. 
we anticipate that the responsibility is going to be moved to the Army Corps of Engineers um, for them to issue the permits, but they are so understaffed in the state of Florida that we think that the timeline for them to issue a permit is going to be significant. We were around six to nine months with the state. We think it's going to be closer to a year and a half, two years with the Army Corps for to process permits. And where's the mitigation at? Because it before used to be split up, right? Is there a designated area that... So I think, there are, I think there are two or three banks that we can go to. We typically get quotes from them to see who gives us the best price, best price but they're all about the same cost per acre. Um, so yes, we have used Plado where we bought mitigation credits before Mr. Melendez. Now are we tied into the site though? If we can't work, make it work, are they, this developer willing to give us a different... Because technically that's not pad ready then, right? Correct. So they're, they're still intent to provide us a pad ready site. It's just that they have to mitigate this piece of wetland in order to give us a pad ready site, and they don't know when they can get that done. Can they reverse it with the development retention area? Can we switch that? This is how they permitted their site with the, with the, with the city of St. Cloud. It is definitely possible to get done. I just don't think it's a very high interest on them because they have. This is just one part of the wetlands on the entire site that they have to take. They have to take out. So their entire site is impacted, not just the piece with the school. But they don't have. They don't have a development retention area on wetlands. A part of a part of this is that that so that the little piece on the top is is for our retention area. Um, I'm talking about the the one south. The one the, the one south is not on the way. Correct. Right. Yeah. So I mean, it could potentially be moved. So I mean, if we could switch that, I mean, it's practically the same amount of acreage. We will certainly have a discussion with them. That's a really good point. Um, we're we're continuing to have discussions with them about what we can and can't do because we do require the school um, just based on the growth that's happening in that area. Uh, the site 28 is uh, an overview of the transportation west facility. So the board did authorize us putting this uh, this facility into construction, and we're currently going through our ODPs and permitting. Again, just for information purposes, we have two pieces of wetlands that needs to be mitigated for this project. One of them is the access road into this into the site in order for us to start construction. And so we don't we don't know what the impacts are yet. We're still trying to understand that because uh, this entire court issue happened probably about uh, three, three, three weeks ago, a month ago. So everybody's, all of our consultants are all over this. I've had more meetings about weapons than I've ever had. And what is the blue mean? The blue are the weapons. Those are the areas that have to be mitigated. So uh, I, if I can, I'll, I'll take you into a quick construction update on what's happening with the market. So I know this is a conversation that we've had um, a while ago when we were starting to see escalation of materials. Um, this information is coming from our, our our own contractors that are doing work for us, but they are national um, companies, so they, they're gathering information from across the entire market. Um, uh, pretty much what we're seeing is a lot of things are stabilizing in terms of lead times. The, the lead times are getting better or, get, uh, or um, at least holding so we can build a schedule with some sense of reliability in it. Um, architectural interiors is certain, certainly seems to be uh, climbing, but not something that impacts us because our projects are usually about a year to 18 months, and you're seeing eight weeks. The big things that uh, I'll point you out at is um, electrical gear and HVAC equipment, and I actually have two slides to break that out. Um, even though HVAC equipment is getting better, it's the equipment on the inside. So one of the things that came out from the analysis is during COVID, when we were impacted, the, state, the United States was impacted with um, supply chain issues because we can get materials to build chips and stuff like that. The federal government decided that they were going to provide incentives for man manufacturers to come back to the states and build these. So a lot of people actually put chip manufacturing plants into construction and so we're now in the period where they are competing with us for the same electrical and HVAC equipment. And so there is a shortage not necessarily because of the supply chain but because so many people are buying them and they just can't make them fast enough. So um, they are definitely having a big impact, but uh, I'll also show you the amount of mega projects that are, that are in construction. The big thing here is the electrical switch gear, uh, electrical gears. You'll notice that even though the timeline's getting better, it's still about a year before we can get electrical gear on site. But we're also anticipating that the prices are gonna go up another 10 to 15% over the next uh, six to 12 months. Um, slide 31 just breaks out the HVAC components to show you that the HVAC equipment, even though the lead time for the interior stuff is getting better, 
that are in, in cultures are probably about 65 weeks. And so this is one of the reasons why we're trying to anticipate um, and we're working with our maintenance and operations folks on, on their deferred maintenance list because we do have chillers that are aged. And so we're starting to accelerate that because it takes about a year before our chillers actually show up on site. Um, so we're anticipating that. Another, that, that's expected. The price increases are still expected to be another 3 to 5% over the next uh, 12 months. Um, the electrical gear is, is usually where the big hiccups are. The thing is, our, our HVAC equipment, equipment can show up on site, but if we don't have the breakers to turn them on, we are pretty much dead in the water anyways. And so um, one of the things that we've done strategically, if you notice, is that we put the project in Kindred in construction in November, October and November of last year. That's about two to three months earlier than we normally would. Um, and we've set that target for all of our projects just to be able to mitigate this sort of risk. So we are doing things on our schedule stand, from our schedule standpoint, but again, we are constantly talking with manufacturers to, to uh, make sure things get out. Just to think a little bit outside the box, and maybe just a, a crazy idea, but um, I mean, you know, obviously KUA, you know, you see, they're constantly buying breakers and things like that. Have we ever thought about like kind of working together with them to do like a purchasing consortium? Because maybe they may have a couple extra in their inventory. I'm pretty sure with all the new construction going on, they got to hurry and throw breakers on their buildings right away too. You know, so, so, so they, 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 so when you see okay, you have a very good point, but they typically stop at the meter, and then from the meter to us is where the switch gear comes in. We are working with them on acquiring transformers because transformers are actually a long lead item as well. So we do work with them very closely. That's a good point, though. So, See, a, a lot yeah, of not that it's the responsibility to pay for it, but if we can like piggyback off their contract, Absolutely. or, or maybe they have a couple extra in their inventory, you know, by coincidence, and we just buy it from them real quick, and they can just replace theirs when they need it. Well, we, we've, we've also that's a fair point, Mr. Menendez. We, we're constantly having discussions with them. I'll definitely add that to the list, but. Um, we work with some really large electrical contractors that do, I mean, work across the entire state and the entire southwest, um, southeast. Um, those are people that have a large amount of buying power, and so we use them. And we do ODP as well, so we buy directly just to save the taxes, especially on large pieces of equipment like this. Um, so slide 33 is really to show you what happened since 2022. Um, you know, the blue line is sort of where the trend was in, in terms of uh, large construction projects. Um, and this is just non-residential buildings. This is just commercial construction. What you've seen is a significant rise since 2022, um, all the way through what we're projecting in 2027 for um, uh, commercial construction to, to be at a historical high in the United States. And that is a part of what's driving the pricing as well as the lead times, because there's just so much need for material. <coughs> Slide 34, what I'm showing you are mega projects in the United States. And if you look at the south of the country, 51% of the mega projects, and a mega project is designed is defined as a project that's a billion dollars and over. Um, you will see that 51% of those are in the south. And we're, that's the market we're competing with for the same plumbers, for the same HVAC techs, for the same roofing contractors. And uh, slide 35 shows you that in the state of Florida alone, we have four mega projects that are happening right now. One of them being the Bright Line, which is sort of wrapping up. But in Miami, they're building this uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, hospital and hospitality uh, billion dollar project um, where they're going to pretty much have um, assisted living facilities above a hospital, a state of the art hospital that's worth over a billion dollars. And, and so when they're, they're, they're asking for the same kind of HVAC equipment that we use, the same kind of roofing that we use, the same kind of doors and glazing that we're using, and that's the, 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 um, the government is also redoing uh, uh, one of the Air Force, Air, Force, Air Force bases, which is going to cost over a billion dollars. And I'm just saying is that within the state of Florida, there is a lot of competition, and that's just outside of our residential or road building uh, work that you see in Osceola County where we compete for contractors. So our best guess, slide 36, is what we see over the next um, uh, 19 months. Best guess that we're going to see uh, price escalate um, about 2%, a worst case 4.5. So there is no end in sight. I mean, this is this is the best that, that the experts in the industry can give us. And so we're, con we're continuing to keep our eyes on our budgets. Um, we're continuing to make sure that we, listen, we've gone past, I think, about 
I want to say about the last year, we've put a ton of projects into construction. And we've seen a lot of the smaller deferred maintenance projects that we've picked up, which we had established our budgets pre-COVID and we never adjusted them. We, we took them into construction, hoping that we'll get the best prices. And, and I do have a slide to show you what those impacts are. Um, we're seeing definitely at least our projects, the biggest hit that we've seen is on the site work side of things, especially in Osceola County. I just think it's just, we're competing for the same kind of asphalt, the same kind of structures that uh, the road contractors are using. So I did kind of give a quick update on slide 37 and what's happening in the, uh, um, uh, with the permitting, the state uh, 404 permits, and this is for the wetland mitigation permits. Um, our consultants are, are, are keeping their keeping tabs on this and, and how this progresses in the court. We are still keeping our permits with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, but we are simultaneously now starting to apply for permits with the Army Corps of Engineers. I do not have a definite answer on where our projects are going to land. The projects that are impacted on this, with this, are going to be the high school, triple A, the turn lanes for transportation east and transportation west because those are our greenfield sites that have wetlands to, do, to be mitigated in order for construction to occur. I mean, we'll turn the, the transportation east facility will be done, but we require a turn lane off of Nova Road for our buses to turn into. Um, that it sits on a wetland uh, along Nova Road, and we don't know, again, depending on when the permits come, that's when we're going to um, uh, deal with it. And I know I'm not talking about gopher tortoises again, I'm talking about wetlands now, so. I just pick one for every meeting, I guess. That's the best I could do. So, go for tours. <laughs> I had to bring it up. So, if, if I can, so we're trying to we're we're trying to uh, understand what the impacts that we're seeing in the construction market, how it's going to affect our projects. We don't see any projects being significantly impacted except the, the new high school. We have wrapped up the design in a new high school. We're making some final changes um, that are minor, in my estimation. We've asked our architect and our contractor to provide estimates to us based on what the final design is. And, and they're taking market conditions into, um, into consideration. And you will see that we think that our site work is probably going to be $10 million more than we thought it was going to be. And then um, from the new construction standpoint, it's the true impact that we're seeing from just the electrical gear as well as HVAC roofing and that sort of stuff that we're seeing in anticipated here. Now, why is FFNE going up too? So it, it's, it's typically just a percentage, Mr. Melendez, but they are made from the same steel and materials that we buy. So the raw materials are the same. Again, this is just an estimate. That doesn't necessarily mean that we expect prices to, to um, go up. So, but we, we didn't want to come in with a low budget and then we did get impacted because they had price increases. But one of the good things that our procurement team does is that they go out and they get the lowest bid. They get three bids from three, three, um, uh, three manufacturers that provide ff &E for us. Um, so because the overall project was going up and we are seeing where raw materials were going, we felt like we needed to at least accommodate that. So some of the smaller projects is on, they're on slide 40, and these are the projects that, that we're working with our, our operations team to um, uh, get going. The, the, last year, the board approved about $28 million for deferred maintenance, and um, our, our maintenance team picked up a significant portion of those, and they're getting those done. What we did was we took over um, a lot of their HVAC projects, the ones that required design and, and permitting from um, and GMPs that we normally would do. And so we did get a lot of smaller projects, but you'll notice that the large ones are the Neptune Middle School bus loop and the Toho fields. Um, those got a lot more, and I think it's just that's where we're seeing that impact to site work. Anything that's related to site work that requires structures, asphalt, or uh, site fill, we're seeing significant impacts to them. Um, and these are, uh, we, we've, we've accommodated these, we'll work with finance to make sure that we have the budgets covered. We just wanted to be, um, just wanted to share that with the board. Uh, I do have three bullet points at the bottom. So OXA, I did talk about the additional work that we found in the auditorium. So we're trying to understand what if, what impacts, if any, those are to our budget, Mr. Melendez. We're working with our teams. Um, and then at Reedy Creek, as we started to plan that project, what we realized is there was a unique opportunity for us to provide ESC services in that community. Um, currently, what would happen is that 
someone that requires test, testing of a, a child to be tested, whether it's hearing or whatever it is, they would have to trek from Pontiano all the way here. Um, because we're building pretty much an entirely new school, there is one small part, small part of that school that cannot be demolished because it wasn't Castaldi out. It's a, an eight classroom building that was pre, it was a precast building that's on site. Um, we are looking at the opportunity to work with our ESC folks to figure out what their needs are. So we're thinking that we can build a satellite office out in Reedy Creek where they can service that community right there and potentially develop Reedy Creek into an ESC hub because that seems to be from a financial standpoint probably the best way to approach it. So it's something that's a, it's a conversation that's continuing to um, happen with our ESC folks. We don't know what the impact is to the budget yet. We're hoping that our budget has enough to cover it because it's not a new building, it's just renovations to the inside. But I just wanted to share that that's something that we're looking at. That, that wasn't in our original scope. Now why, now Reedy Creek is gonna get remodeled completely, correct? So then why is the chillers as a separate line item and not part of the reconstruction budget itself? So the chiller at Reedy Creek failed. 100% outright failed. And so by the time we get into construction is another year. So our maintenance folks, we have a temporary chiller that's at Reedy Creek right now. Um, and our one temporary chiller, I think, I think Mark's here. One, we have one in the district. Two. Two, okay. Well, we have one, which is 50% of our, of our, we have it on a trailer. So we have that, it's not in a good position. The intention, Mr. Melendez, is that the chiller is going to go into the new construction, so it's all. It's just like prepaying, so I guess the overall GMP would go down by the amount of. That is correct. Resident. It's material. So you're not example, paying or saving money, then get to spend it on something else. That is correct. Yes, sir. But we do okay. we do require a working chiller, at least one that's. Oh, I agree. <laughs> one, that's reliable, one that's reliable for the school until we mm -hmm. knock it down. So one of the one of the things, if you look at the phasing plan for Reedy Creek, is that we're going to build a new school in what is now their the area. Right. So as not to put portables and spend money on temporary portables, we're going to build an entirely new school there and then knock it down. So that's another two years by the time we get through that. So we do think we want to replace the chiller. And, and it's a project that was in play for a while. It just that happened right. that the existing chiller failed. Well. Now, and I, and I've done a couple of interviews with some folks, right? And so I'm um, you know, visiting different schools. And obviously everyone wants their school to be remodeled next. And I have to tell them that the Staldi thing, you can't you know, do it so many, you know, so many years before we kind of put you on the list. But one thing somebody told me was, it was a good idea, so I can't take credit for it, was um, does that mean that the furniture has to be that old? You know what I mean? So, you know, just because the building can get replaced, but like for instance, my going to my son's school at Neptune Middle, I'm like, man, even the furniture looks like it's from the 1950s, whatever. You know what I mean? It's like, because can the furniture could get removed? You know what I mean? So like, let's say the building can get redone until three years, kind of like you do with the chiller, you prepaid the chiller, can we prepay some of the new um, chairs so they, they can feel better when they sit down, and then when you rebuild the school, just put the chairs off to the side and put it back in and not have to like replace it right away. Um, just, just as a thought. Understood. No, and that's, that's and I wanted to share. Them. I promised when, yeah. when he spoke to me. I promised him at the workshop. Yeah. I'll bring it up. You know what I mean? So I'm kind of like you know, representing somebody's opinion. Understood. I have on the taking notes. So we'll definitely look into that, Mr. Melendez. I mean, I think one of the things that we've done is um, uh, schools. A lot of schools have bought replacement furniture out of their own budgets um, over time. It's just because. I mean, we have a fixed budget. You guys know that better than most. We have a fixed budget, and we're trying to f find our, the, the biggest impacts that we can, and furniture seems to be one of those things lower on the list. Um, but um, we'll certainly uh, look at any other, any or any options that we have. I, I think eventually, once we get through our comprehensive renovation program, we'll be in a position where we can start looking at a program for furniture refresh and stuff like that. But right now, it's just, I mean, we have more needs than we have funding. Well, no, I understand it. I just thought there's something right. to consider. You know, it's like a variable that's yes, in there when you calculate that. I think that's fair. All right, so if I can, I will ask Mr. Callan to come to the table for us to take us through the real estate portion of this presentation. That's all I have for the design and construction update. I mean, if, uh, obviously, you have access to me anytime, so any questions? Dr. Shano says anytime, that means weekends. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that means weekends. Good afternoon, I'm Tom Callen. Uh, I'm asking the real estate presentation, legal presentation. On slide 44, we talk about the uh, much talked about Pine Street property. Uh, 43. 40, 40, sorry, 43. 40, 40, 40. I'll, I'll be in school. And, uh, and as you can tell, that property, uh, the property was originally acquired by a district back in 2006 for $1.9 million. 
How much? Yeah. 1.9 million. So you've owned that property for about 18 years. And uh, the property is, is a total of 18 acres, but 14 is really one part, and three acres, and 1.7 above there are different parts. And so we've struggled back and forth with developers what to do with it. There's been contracts coming and going over the years on this property. There was a contract back in a proposal back in 21 for 3.5 million. There's a current contract proposals and ranges of two to 3.5 million on the property. The stuff north of Pine Tree, uh, the, the three and 1.7, would probably be best to be aggregated with those, that five acre track there above it and also that 10 acre track. That makes a lot of sense. So uh, going forward, we discussed you know marketing maybe separately or together, you know whatever. But when a developer, if a developer were to purchase from the district, you know they're going to bake that bake that delay cost into the price, having the remnant parcels in the north there. So that's the pine tree property. If, if, if I can, members of the board, one of the things that we were asked to do is to bring to the board all of the surplus properties that we had. So what we did was we're going to start this presentation with what's officially surplus by the school board. And so th there are only two properties that have been officially surplus by the school board, one of them being Pine Tree and the other one being the, pro the, the piece of property next to Lakeview Elementary School, which is uh, uh, what we refer to as the Fifth Street property. Right. No other pieces of property have been officially declared surplus by the school district. So we're starting there. We do have further down an entire list of all the properties owned by the school board. Um, for 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 further discussion. So that's the. That's I'm sorry. The approach. I, I, I no, no, that's fine. Yeah. That's the approach that Tom's trying to take here. Now, on page 43, do we officially make contact with the two um, owners to the side? Because when I drove by the last, it looked like the piece to the piece was getting developed. And well, you know, I, I don't know. So that's the know. easiest way to separate it. Is the two there? They can join. You know. Sure, but again, uh, you know, my experience as a lawyer for government agency. Um, it's hard for you to act as a developer because you show up, the price always goes higher a lot of times. Uh, so my experience has been it's better to have a, if someone wants to buy it from you, have, have the buyer do that, not have you all do that. But the question you have as a board is do you want to market this separately, the stuff south and stuff north, or do you want to do it all together? That's the I mean, I, so one, the first observation that I have is that it seems like we buy very high and we sell very low, right? I mean, it's it, this, this is, this is horrible investment practice where we, we bought it for $1.9 million 20 years ago and now we're selling it for $3 million and everybody else is selling their land for 10 times the amount that we're getting for ours. Why would we buy any more land and add to this as opposed to just selling those plots there? I'm not you buy land. I'm just saying someone would want to do that, not you. Okay, so really my question is that why would we not just sell that as commercial property instead it's frontage on the road? That seems like, you know, that would be commercial aligned. You could do that if you want. If you drive down that, that corridor, which I have, uh, there's, there's not much commercial on that segment there. It seems to be residential. Maybe a townhome, maybe an ALF type use would be good. Um, you know, I mean, it's three acres and 1.7 acres. But that's something to be, that's such your real estate, that's the real estate market will take care of that. Uh, your brokers can help you with that. But this property does present some problems. It does it. It was purchased at the peak of the market back in 06. Yeah, before that the market crash. didn't come back until 2012. Uh, and then the market's, market's peaked. But it has also, it's a small site. It's 14 acres. Um, it has some issues with, with size. I mean, your ideal uh, single family subdivision is about 25, 20 to 25 acres. An elementary school site is very similar to what these guys find. They want to have as many lots as possible. They find that's, that's their sweet spot. So this is a little bit smaller site, 14 acres and stuff. The north has got problems. It could be uh, aggregated with the properties around it to the north, but that's for someone else to do. I wouldn't recommend you put any more money in this project. Uh, but this uh, also shows you, I guess, my experience, if you, buy, if you buy a property in advance and you speculate on property, you speculate. And sometimes you win, like the Noble Road property, property Looking back at that transaction, you all won there. You got it for seventy thousand dollars a gross acre, like one hundred and ten thousand per net acre. You won on Nova Road, which is with the transportation east side. Just to make and it this one this one was a loser based upon what happened in the six of the friend. Just to make it clear though, just I don't so we're on the same machine music. I didn't talk about us combining it. I'm talking about us selling it to the next two neighbors to offer because they may be interested in combining it. Sure. Like if you separate the two, right? The ones on the north side. Those are two like funny triangles, we like to call them. You know, but you got the two properties next to it. 
why don't we just ask them, do they have interest in combining it and just buying it from us? And that way it's an easier split. Because those are kind of awkward. But to, to Mr. Arguello's point, you know, they do lend themselves to a commercial as a secondary. And I mentioned that before. And I mentioned that to Benson Bill before you were on as a superintendent. I said, that would be perfect for commercial because that kind of space kind of leans itself to it. But then they were talking about the city of St. Cloud has to zone it because it may not be zoned for commercial. So just because we're really commercial. It's agricultural out there. It's a big zoning out there. It's going to get a rezone either way, which you want to do stuff with that. Um, the thing is so far, the offers you've been given have been the whole parcels, not separated out. Right. And the person in five acres that we didn't talk with him back three years ago when I was involved with this parcel, and he had no interest in selling. And so it's uh, you have to have a willing buyer and a willing seller. And so it's, that's that's yeah. But the question is, do we ask them though that if they wanted to buy it from us just to know? Yeah, he, he showed, there was no interest shown three years ago. We uh, that was suggested we combine them. Or whatever. I don't know if it's different now or not. Yeah, because so when I drove by there, it looks like they were developing on it. Can we ask our people to reach out to them? It, you know which one? Like the big square to the right. Yeah, and I drove and, by and it. And you saw the states. I saw like the flags with the states. It looks like they were trying to do something. I mean, three years. I'm not trying to point fingers. Three years ago, they might have not been an appetite. But it looks like there there were stakes in the ground last time I drove by there. It looks like they want to do something. I mean, those three acres in that 1.7 acre, I would put a for sale sign. And somebody will put a 7-Eleven on one. And somebody will put a restaurant and a dollar store on the other. I mean, it just seems pretty... We're, we're, we're making a difficulty where there's no real difficulty, except that we have the habit of selling cheap and buying high. So if we're trying to accomplish that, then all of this sounds great. And then what about the 14, the bottom piece? Didn't Valencia College consider so using they did that? Not, they came out and they looked at it and that was not in a location. They want to stay up closer to 192 and 13th Street. They want to stay on the main corridor. This is still way removed from the major traffic corridors. It's more of a collector type road, kind of a still residential character. You may get an isolated uh, personal services type retail there, but you won't get any major. You won't get a traffic. I don't think you'll get a gas station there. There's no signalized intersections. So certain standards you have. The traffic numbers of the road don't justify it right now. It's still not a mature market for commercial traffic's on, on the road to look at. Right. But it's it's uh, we wanted to present it to you. One option we talked about is splitting it up and, and marketing it separately like you all discussed here today, and we'll pursue that. Not that it matters, but what was the intent of that board at that time when it was purchased? What was the intent of the property? So this was at a time when there was concurrency, and there were several developments that were going to come in in this area, and they all came together put some land together and then it was purchased. Um, Covington is actually the one who sold it to us. They've reached out to us several times to buy it for less than we purchased it for. Um, it has been marketed as residential. Then for a year, Bishop Bill did market it for commercial professional business. There were no offers during that year. At one time, the neighbor behind the three acres did reach out to us and then he never followed through. He spoke to the city, whatever his intent was with all of it. The city turned him down. Um, the city prefers that this remains residential, um, not so much um, pushing the commercial professional business. And then they had looked at it twice themselves and then walked away from it both times. So, that's so they the want to put 150 so townhomes on three acres of. No, the, I mean, the 14 it's acres different. was recommended for right. 175. I know, but I'm just saying, like. Uh, the gentleman at Pear never told us what he was wanting to do, yeah. but when he approached us and went to the city, they turned down whatever he was wanting but, but to, to do. But to Ms. Calhoun's part, though, can we really build a school on 14 acres? Everything the elementary, now is 25. So it was an elementary prototype, and then the uh, stormwater was going to be across the street, so we were going to bifurcate. So all the buildings mm -hmm. and everything was on the south, oh, and um, the stormwater was going to be on the north. We're not trying to defend the decision that was made back in the yeah. six. No, that's just what I was just curious. To do. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, the next page, question. The next slide yeah. is, the, okay. is, is the school we talked about in St. Cloud, Lakeview. Uh, this parcel, is the school board bought this in 1974. Four people. Four. For 10 million? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much they bought it for. I'm trying to get that information. But it's four separate parcels that were merged together. This is from the uh, old uh, uh, St. Cloud plot of 1910 and 1925. And so it's a it's a 25 acre parcel. It's got some challenges getting access to it, as you all know. 
uh, from and also surrounding residences who would be complaining about the different types of access with that. It has some, uh, uh, there's a mobile home park on the left hand part there that affects what a buyer would put there because the mobile home park would be perceived as not as a valuable neighborhood as another. So a, and this has some challenges that we've had some uh, contract prices uh, proposals uh, on this property for uh, three years now and they've all been around $3.5 million, a couple at $2 million, so it's still fluid on this parcel. Uh, the city of uh, St. Cloud uh, denied the last rezoning application as you all aware of um, and then but, but with live life and live local act by the state it may uh, St. Cloud may budge off their high horse so to speak and allow more density here. This parcel is perfect for more density as a transitional use between the mobile home park on the west and the single family on the east and south. But the issue of the access has to be resolved around the adjoining properties. There is a strip of access possibly to the north that can be used, the sole access uh, connecting the property off of Columbia Avenue, but that becomes an issue of whether or not that's good enough for a purchaser to sell it. Uh, Size-wise, it's a good size parcel. It does have some title issues. This was at one time owned by the state of Florida back when uh, people didn't pay taxes. Property is sheeted to the state. So this property, uh, three or four pieces, <coughs> three or four components of this 25 acres at one time, uh, about 15 or so acres, was owned by the state. And when they issued title from the state back in 1940, they reserved certain rights either to make sure those rights were terminated. If not, they had to go back and get terminated. So it's got some issues to it. There's some, there's some uh, on this as well. The next part, so we talk about request to acquire property for the district. So these these are not these are not surplus pieces of property. These are just requests that we have received, um, that the districts received, staff has received. So we're just bringing them to you for discussion. And I did send an email to the board last night um, with some um, uh, comments on this one. This one is interesting. The Starling Drive is a celebration. Um, the district did a series of agreements with Celebration back in the mid '90s for the schools. This is one of them. Uh, this has a five-page deed with restrictions in it, and references a 75-page agreement between the school board and the celebration company. And that, like back at that time, everything that came from celebration had so many strings attached to it. So, in order to sell this property, you're going to have to go through that 75-page agreement and see if there's any right. For instance, the celebration right to repurchase the property. And at what point they do there's provisions in that agreement so this is a nice piece of land though it's in a prime location uh, it's uh, in, 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 the, in the PD uh, one of the issues you have there with that is what you get approved by through Disney as well as you get from celebration or as well as the, the county uh, but it does present a very valuable piece of land that we estimate uh, could be worth as much as three million two point eight million for four acres uh, it's either as an ALF or as some kind of a townhome uh, apartment type deal. Um, Celebration is interesting community. It's been primarily single family homes and high end homes. This would be a nice high end condo market for people who want to downsize. Or what do you call it? Uh, it downsize. Mr. Felix, is this the property that's in question, right? So Mr. Felix had a, a tremendous idea which I'm completely on board with. It's This is a, a great opportunity here. <laughs> I mean, if, can we just take it for granted that we want to put townhomes on everything that's on every, throughout this entire packet? Yeah, so then you're going to get no from me. We might as well just make the, make the presentation a little no, bit briefer. Not, not the UC, the UC, the UC. So, that's not our recommendation or anything like that, Mr. Rodriguez. I think it's just a discussion. So you're absolutely right. The, the, the request from the CDD is that, uh, and the discussions that we've had with Mr. Filak is, CDD wants to uh, potentially build a community center here and share a joint use agreement. What I did as uh, just trying to understand how the school district would potentially operate that is what drove the email that you received last night. I met with our safety and security folks. I met with our operations folks. It's not a facilities issue per se where I am dictating what we can and can't build. It's simply, gentlemen, if we were to enter into an agreement like this or, or, or team, and I did ask um, I did ask our team to be here, Scott and, and Lester as well. Guys, if you were going to enter into an agreement like this to build a community center that we are going to have access to, what are your no-goes? And, and Stonewall Douglas has kind of upended any kind of joint use agreements that we have. And so the email that you got from me um, is pretty much the bullet points that 
if we were to work with you. Staff is going to do what the board wants. Let me start by saying that. Whatever the board wants, as long as we have the majority of the board give us direction, go work out to deal with the CDD. We're going to go do that by all means. After having discussions with our team, our operations folks, our safety security folks, that where they landed at, none of our joint use agreements are going really well. And this one, based on what's happening with Stoneman Douglas, plus current legislation, legislation that's, come, that's going through and, and getting approved this year, as well as some that we expect are going to go next year, they are not totally comfortable with the joint use agreement. So what they're suggesting is one of two options. If the board is interested in entering and in, in entering into a deal with the CDD, that could be a complete lob off and hand it to the CDD, whether it's sold or that that's a board decision, whether it's sold or transferred to the CDD, that's completely something that we can do. If we are going to enter into a joint use agreement, then there was a separate document that I sent where what are your no-goes? They want a completely separate building with no access by anybody. And the reason for that is what if a door is left? open what if someone has a key and then they made a, 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 a duplicate of it and then they can access it when our kids are there someone's hiding in it overnight and, uh, and and I mean I know that that sounds worst case but I asked the team to tell me what are your no go no goes on this and so that's what that was that list that you have but absolutely this is a board decision and I think before you get to that team does the, does the CDD have the money to buy this let me get to that point the CDD you all paid Celebration Company, six hundred thousand dollars for his property in nineteen ninety four uh, through impact fee credits. You give me impact fee credits for it. Now there's a provision in that agreement. I just saw it this morning for the first time. Seventy page. It's a very artful agreement with Disney that they did back in those days. And there's a they have a right to buy it after two years, a right to buy it after five years, and after that there's an appraisal provision. It's a very complicated agreement that I need to spend some time with. What I would recommend to this board is not to go too far into this until you see what that agreement says, which you have with the, with the celebration company. Because if they have a right to purchase this, then you and you go through appraisal methodology. The district, you know, I would recommend you go for the highest use possible to generate the highest value if they have a right to purchase that. And I, so I think that that's I think that that's a great idea. Um, to you know, that's a great idea to comply with the contract essentially, but. Mr. Felak, th does the CDD have the money to purchase this property, if that were the case? We would, we have already contemplated, again, we're, we're very early in the exploration, as I said six months ago, we've been kind of waiting on this discussion for a while, um, but it has been floated that we would, we're in a position to do a bond um, that would be covered not only this area, but some other projects we're looking at through, through the town. Um, so just, if, if I could just take two minutes just to kind of tackle a few of the things that came up. Um, we have already had some preliminary discussions with TCC, the celebration company, which is, is a subsidiary of Disney. They have not gone that far along. Again, everything that we've matured to this point really is kind of linchpinning on the conversation we had here six months ago is whether or not the school district is interested either in a joint use agreement or a straight sale or not at all. Um, I will tell you as a first comment, I'm spot on with you. If you tried to sell that and turn that into, into residential properties, all four of you will have the burden effigy in the middle of celebration for trying to do, I mean, there's just way too high of a density area there to even contemplate that. And again, not to say you should or shouldn't do that, but that would, I think, meet a lot of resistance, not only from the town, but also from TCC that, that, that's, that's zoned it separately. Um, you know, we've been kind of waiting on, on the engagement and the discussion. I appreciate, you know, Dave going out and, and he and I have been talking quite a bit um, over the past few months, and I realized there's obviously a lot of consternation, as I've said in all those conversations. I've got two of the kids at the school myself. I've got other board members who have kids at the school. We certainly are all aware and considered about the security considerations. What I'm really asking for is let's have that discussion. If we can have that engagement, have that workshop, whether that's a joint board workshop between our two boards, whether that's between the staffs, however we want to have those engagements, let's get those things down on paper. In, in order for us to be able to move forward, what I really need from our side is, is for the school district to enter into a letter of intent. And, and I, I'm going to use that very broad terms. I know lawyers are going to get involved to define that. But really the intent of the letter of intent is simply to acknowledge the school board's intention that, hey, yes, we would like to explore a joint use agreement. And if it doesn't work, if we want to put a clause in to fall back onto a straight sale, we can do that. Or if you want to put a clause and fall back to nothing, we can do that as well. But the letter of intent would then enable our board to go forward in order to answer some of the questions that I know Dave has come up with, you know, design considerations and security considerations, and we're going to have to get engineering studies on the ground and everything you guys would normally do, we're going to have to do the same thing. In order for me to do that, my board needs to know that at least the school board is behind this and that there is some desire to be able to move forward on this. Um, I will tell you, I mean, you know, my, my legal counsel has told, told us, 
the easiest thing to do here would be a straight sale and just not have the school district involved. You guys either do a sale or a transfer to us since we're a governmental board. You know, that's up to you how you want to do that. Um, as a CDD member, I would say, hey, that's the easiest thing and that could get us moving a lot quicker. As a parent and a community member, I look at it and say for the opportunity that the school district and the K-8 could get from that, from having expanded capacity, you're, you're, and I'm not making a declaration on behalf of the school, but just as a parent, your gym is undersized. When it rains, half the kids sit on bleachers because they don't have the ability to go into a gym class. There's not enough space. We lost the auditorium four years ago and we lost some of the cafeteria space. Doubled the size of the school for what it was initially built. The capacity is less than a thousand. Bless you. Bless you. Now, now we're up north of sixteen hundred students. You know, and, and and there hasn't been a lot of expansion for some of those capacities for the school. So this is one that, you know, as I, I pitched to you six months ago, you know, the, the the overarching idea here is we bond it, we build it, we operate it. You know, even if we got into a point from a security perspective, and again, I'm not saying we can't do this. I'm saying bring these kinds of ideas. If we needed to get into a reimbursement scenario where, hey, there was a school district employee on there that is, you know, following under your guidance, what you want them to do, how your security policies are, how your audits, all that kind of stuff, and we reimburse you in order for that, I, I can't commit that, but I, let's have that conversation. An idea. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm so open here's an idea that here's an idea that I have. I, number one, I would say that we do a straight transfer of title by purchase or or. Um, we see the property to you in some way, shape, or form. Considering that we didn't, the amount, the cost to us, the opportunity is, is, is a big loss, but the cost to us is not high, right? We've had far worse deals for far worse purposes. And some people deserve a burning effigy for it. But I will, I will say this, I think that we should cede the property to you, um, and then you let us use it so that we can reverse the the rules so that our security purposes are not the ones that are um, involved. It's it's yours. As far I mean, because my, my initial concept was you, you would use it during the school day as an expanded capacity for the gym. Well, with your permission, if we had ceded the property over to you, right? So right. we would make our arrangement with you after the fact. If if celebration, if the celebration company is willing to buy it for you know millions of dollars. Great, we sell it to, to, to Disney World per our contract, and if that if they force that to happen, that's fine, right? I mean, then the, the right thing happened. That's why contracts are written, right? And if we have to comply with our contract, fine. Um, and then maybe Disney will work with you to make the same thing happen. So, but I do like the idea. Um, if we were going to do that, I would want to know it ahead of time, and, and, and I think we're getting to the same point. But if there are design considerations, security considerations, I want to make sure that we're building the site so, so in a way that you can actually use right. it and not just all of a sudden I, I, I think you can back out. Mr. Mr. Filak and I have had that conversation and that's that's why I had the conversation with our safety and security folks because if, if this does work out and the CDD builds this, this facility and we use it during the day, then we're still obligated to meeting all of the state's requirements from safety and security. So that's where we had that discussion about, Dave, what are your no goals? Um, so I brought in safety security for that. So it's not just Mr. Aguero's opinion here, because like I said, we need more consensus. I think it's good that staff made its concerns, but I don't think staff needs to make a recommendation on that concern. At that point, just formally present it to the CDD and say, hey, if you want to entertain an LOI, the district is concerned about this, this, and that, and that. Then let the CDD say, okay, that's too burdensome. We don't want to do it. Let's just buy it. You know what I mean? I just think it should be formally presented, whether it's an LOI or some kind of spec sheet, and say, okay, this is the only conditions that we would do a JUA or yeah, JUA. I'm sorry, JUA, or Joint Use Agreement, right? Or just a straight up purchase. So I just think that. Um, that we just need to um, formally present the concerns and then let the CDD respond back. If they go, that's too burdensome, we don't want to build two buildings, okay, fine. Then we cut it. But you may be surprised. They may say they like it. Said, though. I mean, you're representing the CDD and you just said that your recommendation, what would be clearest is for you to just purchase it outright and not have a joint use agreement. You my, are the my, CDD. My lawyer like? has said that that's obviously, and that okay. doesn't take a lawyer to tell that. I mean, that's the cleanest way to do it, the easiest way to do that. But I'm for the school district, I'm trying to figure out if there's a benefit there. I, I would like to see, because the reality is, if we build it and we don't give the school access, there's going to be a limited amount of usage during the day. If I can fit four or six basketball-sized courts in that building, plus community rooms, I, I just, if I look at my crystal ball three years from now, I don't think we're going to actually get 
maximum usage as opposed to, hey, take half that space and have it for the students, you're going to get maximum usage out of that building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I appreciate all the conversation. I don't feel comfortable having our staff present to the CDD. Our staff can present to this board, and this board can direct our staff to to enter into whatever agreement um, or give us direction on, on how to proceed. But um, we're certainly in a position to present those <coughs> concerns to our board. Um, and and then you can make that informed decision on how you want to advise staff to move from there. So maybe the CDD should uh, uh, propose to us, you know, what they want. I mean, I mean, we can if if you're amenable. I mean, again, the the, the first piece that I've looked at JUAs that have done Pasco County has done this before. The JUA is like a hundred and something pages long. If I don't know if the, your board is even on board, I'm not going to spend all the time drafting up 100 pages, kind of throwing darts at a dartboard if I don't know what it yeah, is I specifically. Agree. Yeah. For. Is there a consensus? Or, I mean, what are your thoughts, ladies? I mean, if we can get at least to a letter of intent phase to say, hey, there is desire to explore this, and it's non binding. Listen, if we get to a point where there's non starters, then there's non starters. I think it's cleanest if we just have some kind of conversation about selling the property for me because I have been in the middle of those joint use agreements and they are very messy and I do share some of the concerns that have been presented to us um, and I've been part of this conversation for six months myself so for me it's about what is the cleanest option um, I understand that we do want do we do have some concerns about how students will be serviced because we do have, I mean you're right about everything you said the school is small the students do need some kind of um, recreational area I'm just not 100% convinced that this joint use agreement is going to be beneficial I think it's going to be very messy because I have seen it and it has been very messy now one thing that I'm sorry the attorney you want to say something well, you know, we all originally when this, when this was all purchased back in 94 there was a provision for a celebration companies part of the school properties subject to the rules and regulations of the school board now that was all back in 94, 95. Can you repeat that, please? Yeah, back when you all purchased this property from Celebration, mm -hmm. this, this property as well as the other properties there for schools, there is a joint use component in those agreements for use by the residents of the school property at non-school hours. Um, and there were some reasonable rules and regulations the school board could apply to that and blah, blah, blah. There hasn't been as much as that is contemplated because of what's happened with security for school sites since then. So that, but, but this thing, this agreement is, it's a Larry Pitt special. It was written by Larry Pitt, who was the Disney attorney at the time. And it's, it's like a Rubik's Cube of, of agreements. So you have to really go through them and you will be real precise with it. I became aware of it this morning. It's about 75 pages. So you really, before you tread any further down this road, I, I'd like to recommend what rights you have or don't have first. Yeah, and I'm happy to, if you can find a way to make it work, <coughs> we can comply with the law, make sure that our students are safe, and it be clean, of course. But if it's going to be a very messy agreement, I just think that it's it's easier. Go with God. You know, develop the area if you want to if you want to purchase it, and I'll be supportive in that way. So if you need more time to take a look at that and see if there's a clean way for us to have an agreement, then I'm happy to explore that. But it has been a six month long conversation, and it seems like you are also under a little bit of pressure to deliver an answer to your court as well. Is that correct? I mean, we're right now we're at a stop. I, again, I would much rather take the time if we know that everybody is moving in earnest towards an answer. Let's take the time and find out what the right answer is for everybody involved in the process. For a few months there, there were some stall points and everything else. I feel like we've gotten some wind back under our wings here. If it's going to take another 30 days for everybody in the team to do what the team needs to do, right. then that's great. Um, Celebration Company has some rights on this agreement, mm -hmm. and the rights were if they want the property, they have a right to buy it. Right. If you're not going to use it. And so that would be, no. I, want, I want to ferret that out first before you go any further. What rights they are, if any, so you guys don't. Would you send us the contract so that we can read it? Yeah, I'll do that. Well, one thing I would ask Dr. Shanoff, out of respect to all this, um, kind of going back to what does staff want? You're talking about the school. Has anybody even asked the principal? Like, does he have future use? Does he want to do something with it? Does he want to have a lab? Because technically the district owns it. If the, the, the school's getting tight or overgrowing, 
I mean, I mean, I like to see what the principal says. You know, what, what, what if he had a dream? What if I wanted to make a baseball field that's better than the one that exists or something like that? So I can I can certainly have those conversations. Um, the conversations I have with um, with building principals typically takes place with what's going on today right. um, and not necessarily looking into the future. The other thing that I would I would say is that um, you know every everybody has an expiration date in their position um, and so uh, Mr. Whedon I, and I know that they love Mr. Whedon at Celebration K8 and, and Mr. Whedon um, uh, Mr. Whedon is beloved but Mr. B Mr. Whedon won't be there forever so um, I, I'll just tell you that that principles just because I was one for 14 15 years um, we typically don't look that far into the future because that's really not our charge. We're temporary occupants of a position. And so that's that's really how we view our role. I'm not trying to punt on, on your question. I'm just saying that I'm not exactly sure whether or not principals view that as their role um, to be able to say and conceptualize, hey, this is what I think this needs to look like two years from now, three years from now, five years from now. Because then all of a sudden, what if they're gone? What if they've moved on to another role and, and the next person that comes in doesn't share that same value set? Um, so it really needs to come and be driven by the board. Strategic decision. A strategic decision, board. correct, exactly. Yeah, but, and, also and has then, to, but also has to be based on input, though. If I'm somebody that's going to make a strategic decision, I need to know, is that gym full or not full? I might need to just build another big gym and get rid of that gym. You know what I'm trying to say? I need to know, boots on the ground, how it's being used. To, to your to point from board member Melendez, um, it would be a good, an interesting conversation to have. Where do we see the population of Celebration K in the next five, ten years? Because that is part of the equation when I think about what we're going to do with, with the land. So I definitely under, like, I, I agree with board member Melendez that that is part of the conversation that we should have as well. But I can tell you one thing that's not going to be great is 50 townhomes next to the school. Right. That's so a disaster. My question was not about what. No, I wasn't we referring built. to what you just said. I'm just yeah. saying in general. It's about when we're what talking does the about what the, look like? well, what the school wants, or right, what what's going to service the school. 50 townhomes so, is an unmitigated disaster. A great reason to create a burning effigy. So what we can do, um, and I, I don't mean to cut you. Were you I was done. Okay. Um, what we can do is we can certainly look at at our GIS and and look at where um, the population will be moving um, in terms of this school's population over the next five to ten years mm -hmm. and we can certainly pull that data what I can't promise is that Mr. Whedon will be there ten years from now no of course so, yeah. so and I he may not even be, be. <laughs> But that's the purpose. He may not even of, be the correct stakeholder. But that's the purpose yeah. of the strategic yeah. plan, though. But I mean, he still needs to be a stakeholder. Uh, like we just said earlier, Reedy Creek might need ESC. How do we know what's not needed there? You know, so the point is, we own land, and before you get rid of it, you ain't getting it back. You know, and right. unless there's a volcano coming there creating more land, you ain't gonna get more land. Well, and I think that's something know? we have to consider, especially with this contract that we have, is if there is a point where we have to mm -hmm. allow them to have the option of purchasing it before we send it anywhere else is we've got to know that we're sure that that 50 townhome community isn't going to be what pops up because of a sale that we tried to move forward but their with. purchase of whatever purchase right they have on the agreement uh, does say at this stage that being 30 years down the road that's valued based on replacement value mm -hmm. now that's that's a good time for lawyers to camp out what replacement value is but Jim that we would be a fair market value as high as the best use. But if so. we if we're not in, interested in selling it, I mean we we can keep the property. It's only if we're interested in selling it would we have to possibly go to the first. hypothetical hypothetical appraisal and valuation of market value. Right? That's okay. and that's all hypothetical, but that's the contract provides. Could I make a suggestion and, and maybe invert my original comment? If you wanted to do a letter of intent with the idea of a straight sale for now, and that gives you and your, your staff time to figure out here over the next 30, 60 days, listen, it's going to take us time anyway to get engineers and project managers and everything else to get them going. Whether we end up doing the JUA path or whether we do a straight sale path, I'm still going to need to get those people on board. If we can start that process now towards an LOI just for a straight sale and knowing whether or not 
you guys are looking to do a fair market value sale or you're looking to do a land transfer, however you're looking to do that, if you want to start that process now, at least I can get the wheels turning. If you come in 60 days from now and say, hey, this is the greatest idea, we figure out how to make this work great, we'll adjust fire and we'll start moving towards the gateway path. Uh, members of the board, if I may. Um, so is it possible for us to give Mr. Callan some time to, to, to understand the contract and see if Celebration yeah, Company does suggest. have some, some rights mm -hmm. to this? We will certainly communicate that to you. Um, and then if we can move forward from there, if the board is open to it, majority of the board, let's say Celebration has no rights and they don't care for it, then we can shift to the CVD because that they're two different entities. Okay, so let's establish what our rights, what Celebration's rights are that regarding the contract. Yes, okay. Can we give you a debt? I know that deadlines, because we have been having this conversation for a while and I kind of want to just wrap it up and move forward with whatever it is that we do. How long do you think you'll need to be able to determine what that contract says and the implications? It's got nothing to do after this, <laughs> Rhonda, Frank, and I went through this on the other school site agreement. So I'm kind of familiar with how Larry Pitt does stuff. I know the title work out there, I've ordered the title work with you all three times and all that. So if you can give me about a week, that would be good. Okay. And then I get a I, I get a memo to the and we will, we will to, uh, Dr. Shanoff will send a memo to the board on on what are, what what how he interprets this and then if the decision is for us to start talking to the to the CDD then board directs us to do that and we can start having that conversation. Can you wait a week for to move forward? Is that well, you can wait six months? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to speed yep. it. Here. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, if if you guys are comfortable doing a conditional, I don't know how that works. I mean, you know, if it gets through, I, I know we've talked to TCC, and I certainly can't represent them. But I, I think you're going to find they have no interest. They're actually trying to pull out of town with some of the properties they have and other stuff they have. So I think you're going to think you're going to find a favorable path there. But obviously, they need to tell you that if it helps us being in the meeting because we've already engaged them conceptually with this idea, and they've nodded their head and said, "Hey, yeah, it sounds great." They obviously know what rights they have on that land, and they haven't indicated anything to us that would be counter to what we're saying here. So if it helps that we're part of that conversation, let me know if I can get my attorney involved in it. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. But it, it, can I, can I, am I at least hearing from the board, because I do have a board meeting tonight, is there a desire, if the rights are waived by Disney and TCC to buy this land, is it the consensus from the board that at least, hey, yeah, Good with a either a straight sale or a transfer with a JUA conversation possibly pending. If you find that with staff, is that is that fair to take back? Don't get a head nod or a, what? Yeah, because I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm yes. Okay. That's a big sub. So right now we're at that's yeah, a, that's <laughs> huge. There's a lot of there's a lot of ifs, ones, and, and I don't love that. Issues. To be honest with you, I don't I don't. There's a lot of there's a lot of like additional you don't, you don't conditions. I'm comfortable with waiting a week until we have the full, I need to see the entire picture. I know we've waited for six months and I understand that there is a lot of, um, there is an urgency of course, right? You want to get things started and I fully understand that. But just, I also understand that I'm not, I don't want to make a decision do that I don't understand no, later on. Yeah. So. So I can agree just to give clarity at least on my position. I can agree on waiting a week for that the contract language to get revised, but also for staff to look at, hey, this is your last chance. Now, before we decide to give it away, do you want to build a gym there instead? A huge monstrosity that is part gym. Of the Do you want to do some, maybe it's not Mr. Whedon, maybe you're somebody smarter than him or wants to love this district longer that's going to last forever. You know, somebody from staff I got you. that thinks strategically about what we can do with this property Understood. before we commit to give it Once it's gone, I don't want to have a, I don't want to, Stop halfway. Cool. I'm saying, once I say CDB, I want to pretend I don't want to have that property anymore. Now I don't want somebody later on to go, man, what if we could have built a pool there? What if we could have done whatever? Like mm -hmm. now's the time to wish for something. I'm, you know? I'm happy to go ahead and have that discussion internally with staff and then communicate that out to the board um, prior to um, Mr. Callen, um, Mr. Callen following back up with you by next Tuesday. So I can have that conversation internally um, with with our team. Um, much faster than Mr. Callum can review 70. And it's, it, <laughs> and it's just simple, right? Like, do, does the district want to do something with the property? Right? That's, that's, that's basically, basically it. Question. Yes, absolutely. And I think what, what, what Mr. Felak was just asking for is, does the district want to entertain further discussions on this transfer of land? 
right? I mean, that's really all you're asking for, right? And how much you're willing to commit to? I mean, that's, I think that that's to, to dig, explore, just explore. Sounds like you've already, I have already given my answer to that question. Yeah. I'm not sure if you have. But. I, I mean, I think we're all in a similar agreement, but I think if we've waited six months at this point, what's one more week to ensure that we kind of get ourselves on an even playing field to move forward with that? I think we all have the general intent. Okay. The other item we have next page is, um, is the Boggy Creek Road property. Uh, again, this is a, a high school, I think it's a high school site, 75 acres originally that was purchased, three transactions in 2008. Um, and you have 11 acres there that is not surplus, it is not to be, it's not been designated yet. That's a term I use. Call it a legal term, undesignated property. So um, it's that shape there. And uh, that has uh, had some issues with the values there and, and comparables, and that market is pretty robust down there, as you all know. And so there's a lot of opportunities there if you wish to do something there, and it's all again access will be a major issue about that parcel. So, members of the board, um, this piece of property was always intended. I think looking back at the original concept plan for this high school was to do a middle school out there. Um, I mean, we've looked at it, and that's why the bus loop was built the way that it was built, and the HVAC system was built the way that it was built, um, which still is an issue for us. But um, I, I think staff has looked at this, and based on the growth in that area, there is no need for a middle school there. So it is, it is property that we use it for lacrosse practice and stuff like that. We did receive a request from uh, UCD for a charter, because they wanted to build an ESC charter. Um, on that property. Um, we cannot talk to UCP without the board authorizing us to do that, but they have, they don't know that this will work for them, but again, very similar to the discussion before, UCP would like to actually start looking into it, doing their test fits and stuff like that before they make an offer to us. 11 acres is pretty big for a charter school anyways. Right? So what would we do with the excess? Well, entrances are, entrances are an issue um, with this one, so they'll probably have to shift back, and they have to get their own parking and everything separately from us, so it's not necessarily that we're going to allow them to use any part of our property. Right. I have considered the idea of selling children, which I'm pretty sure Mark may punch me in the face for, but um, uh, because of our HVAC system is right there, so figure we could use our chillers and, and offset some of our costs. That, that's a whole different discussion. But they would have to have completely different entrances, completely different parking, so it could end up being true, up for sure. But. Now, just in general, like my thought process, um, I like the way the district, and I'm giving district kudos, the K model. I'm not real big into just developing one middle school or one elementary school. Because I remember back in the day when I first got elected in 2008, the economy <coughs> shrunk and Orange County had to close a bunch of those specialty schools. So we were able to absorb some of those hits because we had the K-8s. So I can understand the intent was to do a middle school, but I'm just not in favor of us building middle schools if we don't have to, you know? So if you're saying the population isn't there to, to, to sustain that or to justify it, I'm not for a middle school being built there. Um, I can't imagine what else to do on 11 acres on Toho. It's already fully built out because I don't believe in the mega monstrosity of a high school. You know what I'm saying? Because like, like I just said earlier, you know, Celebration Kate was kind of tight in its space. It may grow. Lord, I don't know if I want Toho to grow any bigger than what it is. <laughs> and that's just my personal opinion. You know what I mean? Because you start getting to like 5,000 students on like one school. I mean, like, you're really going to have hard press to get good attention, quality instruction to those students for the services they need. So it, I'm just kind of running through the process of elimination of what else we could possibly do with that. Um, and I think that maybe a, a charter school may be the best. You know, and then I guess a, a, a UCP doesn't really compete with us either. So they're not even drawing our students. That's the offer services that we need. Mm -hmm. Correct. So um, if there is excess land, again, like what I mentioned before, then throw up a cell phone tower on there if we can, you know, in the corner. You know, I mean, if it, like, what do you do with that excess? You can get a nice little cell tower agreement and start generating some extra revenue. I'm not you know? yeah, I don't think you want me to do that with 11, though, right? No, not with the whole 11. No, I'm just talking about, let's say the charter school typically takes five acres, right, in general. I see what you're you know, And then another two, three acres to, to, to get like, their own driveway. Understood. There happens to be an acre left. What do we do with an acre? Man, Understood. see if we can re-talk to somebody to connect to a cell power Understood. and generate some revenue out Understood. of it. So am I hearing that 
from the board is a consensus that it is okay for us to have discussions with QCP about them potentially acquiring a piece of property? I like the ECP idea, um, or her. I mean, that's I think that that's a good idea, a good use of the land. I disagree with uh, school runner Melendez in the sense that we shouldn't build a middle school if if I'm surprised that it doesn't merit the build of a middle school to be honest that area but smaller schools do better than bigger schools right that's there's plenty of evidence that, that demonstrates that so I'm in favor of building small schools to me this is kind of like a giant monstrosity of a high school showcase this is I mean this is a huge school um, so I mean I, I don't know I, I'm, in, I'm in favor of smaller schools I think that that serves the community better builds stronger communities has more part parent engagement and involvement so um, now when you say that I am an ECP support. now what about the legal aspects of that are you allowed like for instance CDB is technically a quasi government or whatever government government entity we can just talk to them but are you allowed to even do that legally do we have to like say okay does anybody else come what rights does UCP have to say, okay, I want to do that? Not some other charter school that wants to say, well, I want to do the same concept. Why don't you open it up to me to be able to do the same type of school? That's a fair question. And I think the intention, sorry about so that. They were, so the, the broker's analysis was due to the uniqueness of it, that they would market it to institutional uses. So we can start by the way we market it. Um, making sure the county's good with another institutional use there and then marketing toward that. So then it's based off of the offers that come in through our <coughs> So we would have to publicly offer it out. Because yeah, because but that, but that wasn't before I made my comment. So it sounded like, hey, we were just giving it to UCP. No, we well, just, just the request was from UCP to, to acquire the piece of property. To okay. do further due diligence, but they understand there is a process. They, they have to go through the process, and it's the same process we would go through where we would do the appraisals and stuff. Now, we're allowed to legally, since we got a lawyer here, that's pretty awesome. Are we allowed to say, okay, we're only selling it for like a conditional basis, it being a school. You know what I mean? Like we don't want to just sell it to somebody who have 20 townhouses and we'll get returned. Return. Return. So I would like to be able to do that with board's direction. I don't want to give direction myself. Well, is but that what the institutional uses part was? It would start limiting who? Because yeah. right now it is zoned institutional. So yeah. okay. the other is district owned property school simple future high future school sites uh to hope off at water west so members of the board you have a separate handout where we, we yeah. so we put the maps for these properties on there it wasn't something that we included in the presentation but um uh it did come out as we were reviewing these that we needed to show where these are located um so the the, the properties that we have acquired for future school sites is the high school site to hope um, 47 acres, um, and, and this was required. Then we have the high school site, which is in the Edgewater subdivision, and these are all pad ready sites um, that with, with utilities and roads and stuff, and, and, and wetlands mitigated. I start here and go for tortoises out of the way. Um, the school, the site at Edgewater is 48 acres, and then we do have a piece of property at um, uh, off of uh, Old Hickory, with what we refer to it as Old Hickory. Right, and so that is 15.4 acres. Um, yeah, understood. It's a uh, yeah, it's shown there in, in blue uh, piece of property. And, and um, so the uh, elementary school site in the south. I don't think I had the picture of this. Elementary at Hickory. Oh, so oh it's, it's just a different. It's just, it's, yes, it's, oh, it's the same. It's the same. It's the same property. Oh, okay, okay, I'm sorry. No worries. We should have probably labeled it all the cell as well. Um, at the cell as well. Dead ends at the So um, the one property that we um, didn't list here is the one next to um, Harmony Middle School, which is uh, two pieces of property. Oh, two left. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So it's conservation easements. They were so part of the purchases. Of, so when we did the um, land purchases, when we did the Birchwood back in the day, um, part of that was we had to take the conservation areas with them and always leave them as conservation areas. So they'll show up on our land inventory, but they always have to remain um, identified as the conservation parcel one and parcel two. So these are properties that are owned by the school board, but as being a part of the conservation easement. So it's a similar thing that we were dealing with for the Oxabus Road, where it takes what I consider now an act of God to get the um, government to release an easement in order for you to construct on it. Um, can it potentially be done? Yes, but then 
whoever acquires that property would have to go through that. And, and the state has pulled, put a, a full clamp down on releasing any weapon easements that they have. I'm going to get in trouble for hunting that land. Are you? Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> the next uh, issue we have is the inventory of school uh, houses. They call it fish. So, and, uh, sorry, Tom. So we've listed all of the properties owned by the school board um, on the next few slides um, for five, six slides. Um, at, the, at the end of the slide, the ones that don't have a name yet, those are the vacant parcels that the school board owns. Um, we just felt like we should show you everything that the school board has. And um, again, if there's a specific site that we need to discuss, we can absolutely do that. Let you know to information purposes, all the all those parcels there, you have 2,355 acres of land you own in the school district. Of that 2,355 2, acres, you got about 580 acres so far is vacant, but with about 200 or so acres transforming quickly into improved property. So you have about 2,355 acres total adding it up through his Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, so I like what you guys have done so far. And um, what I would like to see though, um, in no rush or anything like that, um, remember how we looked at Toho High School and there happens, so it's not considered vacant property because it's one property, but there happens to be 11 acres of you know additional land that hasn't been used. I would like to see what is five acres or more on any school site that's not being, that's empty. Like I don't want to say it's vacant because it's not vacant because there's a school site on it, but like I mean, like if you take the school site and the parking lot lot on the on, you know away, right? Where is there an extra five acres extra? And a point, a, a perfect example is Pleasant Hill Elementary, or is it Pleasant Hill Middle School? Pleasant Hill Elementary. Hmm? Elementary. 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 Pleasant Elementary. Yeah, Pleasant Hill Elementary. Perfect example. You know, it's a school that was going to have like some other school site sited on it, but was never developed, just like Toho. So I would like to see where those are. But they have to be greater than five acres. I'm not going to talk about less than five acres. It's too small for that. It's just we that'll can, be an extra we, soccer we field. Can, we can absolutely do that. Mr. For Tohoku and Edgewater, why did we buy 50 acres instead of the 25 that the school requires? It's our high school sites are sites. larger. But even our other high school sites are, yes. they're, they're all they're, larger. They're, they're all much larger. They're all 50? Mm -hmm. That's they're right. a minimum of 50. Based um, on the shape of the, the light. orange ones are high school sites. So they're minimum 50. So yes, we do have some larger sites, Mr. Mr. Arguello, um, but if you look at the new um, the new prototype that technically we ended up with for AAA, we're building it on roughly 45 acres, so this works perfectly. Uh, 50 acres is the minimum we can build a high school on and still fit our athletic facilities, uh, practice fields, you know, football fields, and then offs and, and stacking as well, as well as, but 50 acres, Mr. Arguello, I need to clarify. 50 acres requires off-site retention, it does not have retention ponds on site. Okay. So those are the pad ready sites that they take the retention ponds. And that's about it's about twenty five percent increased savings to you. So that would be about a sixty five acre site be it on site retention. By that, by that not being off site and save you some, some space. Um, that's the end of the real estate part there. Legal counsel stuff, uh, I wanna just go over a couple items here. Kind of process, just the, just general concepts. Uh, you know, we need to look at the issues, wetlands and floodplain soils, access zoning, utilities. And basically what you're doing is you're taking land that's rural and going into suburban area, basically what we're doing, like the developers around there. And uh, many times these projects like Edgewater have been in the process of getting zoning approvals for 10, 15 years before we show up and buy it. Uh, so, so that is it, 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 usually these properties have a, long, a well developed history by the time we show up. Uh, challenges, the next slide. This is the hottest market in the state, and you are the hottest of the hottest, Osceola County. You, you're getting more uh, convert. And this is so it's a five-acre area. There's a need to build houses, a need for for development, and uh, people want to uh, develop. And so this is a, that's just what you have to deal with. Now, I, this next chart is about my past experience. I call it stage of value, and I used this in a jury trial in West Palm Beach one time, and it really made a, a good impression with the jury. So you start with a bare vacant land, then you get entitlements, then you get permitting, then you get plats, then you get infrastructure. As you go through each process of that process, land gets more and more valuable. So what our challenge, is, the challenge of the school district, is to make sure what you're buying is that you're paying for what's the proper phase. You're not paying the, the, 
level five fully 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 valued when it sits bare vacant land. So the staff's been really consistent about that. Uh, who we purchased from are people who are 25. I thought we were buying land at the at value. We are higher than. No, we're buying land at the, at the at the pad level. So we're not paying for bare. We're not buying for bare vacant land value. We're paying for pad level, which requires. Next slides will tell you about that. The owners of these properties. Uh, I, can, I can skip forward, but who we're buying it from are people who own 25 to 50 acres of land typically. Uh, most most of the time, they're speculators themselves. They bought from other people. To package, make a permit approvals, and resell, make a profit. It's their business. They have their own constituencies to answer to. Uh, we have ours, they have theirs. A lot of times it's their banks, their financiers, their pro forma, their partners, uh, private equities in these, in these a lot of these properties. In Orange, in, in, a lot of the property here in uh, Osceola County is involved with private equity in New York. And that was showed up in a couple of re recent transactions we had. So you're dealing with highly sophisticated sellers. Um, so what happens is we've been seeing a lot of higher prices and you know it takes your breath away at times, you know, fire remorse and all that. Uh, it is the market. Uh, you don't know when you time the market in advance. You only know when you're looking back if that was a good deal or a bad deal. Um, and so that's the challenge we have here. And so this is just the start. So when the school district acquires sites, we don't we try to avoid or minimize extended holding period of land. <clears throat> You saw the example of that 2006 piece of, on, on Pine Tree. That's a money loser holding a piece of property for 16 years. It's not good. And so we try to avoid that, try to get in and out within three to five years at best case on land because after that, the whole period has a, has a cost to you, both you know, both a, a time cost, emotional cost, as well as a, a loss of capital cost that period of time. Um, and there's also fencing and maintaining properties. We try to avoid that by getting pad ready sites ready to go without having to do that. Um, and we talked about pad ready sites though. And so the, uh, the advantages again, pad ready site, you avoid costs, you avoid risk, um, you avoid the creation of additional layer of engineering employees at your, at your school district. If you have to go permit these, these items, you have to hire people to do that, to monitor contracts outwardly, you have to expend money yourself. And again, that minimum, that minimizes costs. Um, so the purchase of pad ready sites, the site is partially approved, it's not vacant land. The owner has already spent time and money on that property to get it pad ready typically. And that means they have had a whole period of what their purchase price was. They have a whole period of what their costs are putting into it. They have to borrow money to pay for those costs. So they're, they're, they got their whole pro forma of what they're spending on this property. So that's why typically in Edgewater, you'll see a piece of property, Edgewater. They bought that property at 1,800 acres, one portion of Edgewater, for like $35,000 an acre. They could roll in. Big number. Big one. Biggest number I've seen in Oslo County. And then they held it for about three or four years. And then they're putting pad ready, putting roads in, you know, those kinds of things. When we got down to boot buying that property from them, the price was upwards of $200,000. They put it in the ponds, they put it in the roads, got the permits, planted all that stuff, build it, all those kinds of issues. So that's what the that, that's kind of how it works, uh, the development. Uh, this slide does deal with that issue, price consideration, pattern ready. Um, in the appraisal process, we uh, we select appraisal they select, the current process is this. Since this is a consensual process, is that we have an appraiser, they have an appraiser. And if they just the appraisers do appraisals, they're off, off by a certain percentage, we do a third appraisal. We've, uh, and as appraisals, what we've attempted to do in recent contracts I've had is to set what the density is for a property. What's the highest and best use? What are they appraising? I don't want the appraiser to determine it based upon its highest and best use. That means the most profitable use, I want it based upon four units per acre, single family. We did that with uh, Sunbridge, I believe it was. Sunbridge. And in Edgewater, we <clears throat> and that's real important to lock that lock those things down, both the use and the number of units per acre. And so we're getting into that. Sometimes they resist that. They resist that. And then we and then we also try to make sure that the sales that were being used uh, are considered by the appraisers are apples to apples. They are pad ready sales with drainage. If they're not, then there should be a deduction in value. And those kinds of issues we do with that um, an appraisal review process. And location as well. What we've been recently doing, and Frank insisted upon this, and I think it was a good, good call on his part, was that notwithstanding what these contracts said and what the appraisals do to set a purchase price, is that ultimately the board has to approve the purchase price. 
You can't have appraisers tell you what you're paying for property. Do the board tell them what the school district is ready to pay for the property after they go through what they think it is? I think that's important because you know you're the governing board of the school district, and you know, you know for instance, you know, the, the, the principle is that um, under uh, Florida law, any contract of school district is only good for one year. You fund it. You don't fund a contract, then you don't have a contract. And that same principle should apply for buying a property. And so you, the board should always have the ultimate saying: Hey, here's the here's the appraisal price based upon the contract. You can approve it or reject it. At least you have you know, that. So we've been insisting on that lately, and it's helped out. It's helped out the differences in the appraisals, by the way. So I think it's a good, good process to have. Uh, legal contract issues are we try to gravitate towards a form contract. We had a form contract we didn't like. We made changes to it, and we gravitated towards it. both Marcos and myself and Rhonda and all that. If I can, real quick, um, on, on that last part, too. Um, and I agree with what you said, we have the final say, but to a certain degree, but um, also seeing appraisals adjust themselves, I don't know if it's by magic or by whatever, based on what the offer is too. So if I sit there and I say, I want to make an offer of $10 million on a property, for some magical reason, that's where appraisals come into play. You know what I mean? So I'm not saying it's supposed to be that way. No, the point 9 is 9.5 million and 10.5 million, yeah. incidentally. Yeah. Well, so, so instead of letting the appraisals do their thing first, yeah. you know, yeah. I kind of like the same concepts, staying pad ready, everything like that. Just in the contract itself, we sit there and do our own evaluation of what we think it is. Well, we do that. Make the offer in the contract, and then the appraisal substantiates the offer, yes or no, rather than just letting the appraisals well, fight out. Why does it a purchase price? You know, mostly it says it's price will be determined by the appraisals. But I agree with you, you know, the old saying, MAI, what is MAI standing made as instructed? And so uh, the MAI process, and you, you brought up the part about the appraisal process that is a, a vagary of it. And so we know it's there. So you have to have people that understand the real estate value and what, what prices are going up or not going up. And if that's too much of an increase of the previous purchase, you step back and say, what's going on? Um, but the legal contract issues, we try to standardize a contract, but we it's, it's proved difficult at times because this is a consensual process. Uh, you know, and I don't want to get into concurrency yet. We'll do that next next workshop because Sarah Corn told me not to get into concurrency, so I told her I would. <laughs> so and yet, workshop for concurrency. Yes, it's not about not but, getting into it today. It's about having the, the current, time to discuss it. <laughs> under the current process in this county. This is really a consensual process for school sites. And if we don't reach an agreement, they get to go forward their development. So there is an incentive for them to have. So it really is a, it's really a, a play nice agreement where that the developer should want to have good quality school sites convenient to his, its intended buyers, rebuyers. So he should play ball with us, but the same token, we have to, we can't be difficult with them because they could then go off and say, heck with it. But the reality is most school, when the most important part of people buy a house is the school district, eventually. And so that's, that's but the system we have here in this county does require some kind of a getting along. There's no requirement one way there or something happened. We just have to do that. Um, and so the final point I want to make, this is my, this is me talking. And so I'm an old lawyer. I'm 62 years old. I'm looking forward to retiring someday. I've um, been doing this for about almost 40 years. Is that when you negotiate with people, it's sometimes good to have a good cop back up. And sometimes, I, we did agreements recently with a, with a part with a landowner. Even though our agreement said X, we said we wanted X with a discount of 30%. Because why? I said, because if I go to that board and that board figures out blah, 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 it could blow up the whole thing here. So I think you need to give a 30% 30, 30 discount. So it's really helpful at times to have the board can be the heavy, but it requires that sometimes we have to, if you get too active in discussing things with, and this is where it's, it's a tote, it's a, it's a, it's very, you know, because you're elected officials, you have constituencies yourself, um, but getting not too involved in the real estate acquisition process, if the staff is good enough, the staff should be good enough to get to you and let you know when it's your turn to have input and direct the project. But sometimes I've had board members, not you all, but others, that they start negotiating with the other side, and you're the lawyer. But if I have a client negotiate with my opposing side, I've lost all leverage I have. 
that's part of my, my leverage and loss. So it's really important to understand that when you do talk to the opposing side about real estate and stuff like that, um, that you will lose leverage in the negotiation. And I would recommend first before you do that, get with the superintendent, get with Dave, get with the real estate person you deal with, and have a discussion before you do that. You have a coordinated strategy because that way it'll get you the better deal. Okay, that's all I'm trying. You can talk to them, but first talk to them after you get with Dave and, the, and, your, and your staff, your real estate staff, and make sure you have a coordinated strategy before you go out and do that. Because if you do go out and talk to people, sometimes uh, you lose uh, uh, leverage. So, I mean, I, I think that all that makes perfect sense. Osceola is kind of a strange animal. But it, not in every case, though. I mean, mostly I would recommend you do that. There'd be exceptions to every rule, including this one. And so well, I this entire that. county is an exception is the problem. So, you know, there, there's a reason that we have adversarial processes in, in, in a court, right? There's a reason that it has to be adversarial in order for both people to be represented to the maximum capacity. So in, in real, real estate transaction, although it's not considered adversarial, you have two distinct parties. In Osceola County, these transactions are not always two separate parties. Sometimes everybody's in the same boat, oaring in the same direction. And that's not a good way for the district to buy property, but that is an absolute reality. I mean, just a few short years ago, we had a chairman there and we had an attorney representing the other people and they were married. Okay, that just demonstrates the absolute ridiculous level of everyone being in the wrong point in, in, in this adversarial setting, right? It creates a terrible situation for the public where they can't even trust the school district, much less the other party, to be doing the right thing for the community because we are elected officials and we have a duty, right? So, I, I, I mean, all that makes perfect speak, sense. I wasn't speaking to that. I was. I was. Okay. So, okay. so I mean, that makes perfect sense what you're saying. And I would love for those to be the concerns that I had if it was just a simple because that's those are those are issues that were resolved in practice, right? But in here, we actually have to be conscious that there are people that are making these deals that probably shouldn't be involved at all right or representing people that should not be involved at all and and that's something that has to be overcome in this district especially because we are the hottest real estate market so i mean if we if we are if we do our jobs then we have to address those issues that are absolutely part of the culture of this district well that's why frank wanted to go back to the board approval because at the end of the day you all need to have that check as the board approval but before you get to that point there'll be times when people want to contact you or contact that and complain about this and you have to listen to it i understand that you have to interact but it really makes but sometimes if you do that you can lose your leverage in negotiation so before you do that or if you want to do that get with get with dr shanoff or get with dave or Rhonda and, and your real estate people to figure out okay this is where i'm hearing what do you all say and because you because these are negotiations. A couple people have contacted you all and got involved with the district in the past, and it really undermined the real estate guy's ability to, to tell the guy to buzz off. And with the, he needed to hear, because he went behind them and got the principals to agree what he wanted to do when the, the real estate guy would have said otherwise, to give you more leverage. And so I was trying to give you, if you want the best deal, I just encourage you to listen to your real estate person and listen to your professional staff, your lawyers. And of course, it's exceptions to every rule. You know, and you make that you make that judgment call. Here's my last question. I'd like a thirty percent discount on our legal fees. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm talking, about, talking about the legality, um, and, 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 um, and, and I can agree with Mr. Arroyo's point. Was like every single thing we don't want to just townhouse it out, but there is a possibility. And I read the state statute itself that the school district has it within our powers to do affordable housing for its employees. And so that's something that I would like for you to kind of you know maybe look at. You know, instead of us selling it to another third party to be able to sell it out and then build townhouses randomly, you know, I know this, the legislature last year had a hometown heroes, and the governor during his speech said, I don't want a teacher driving more than 50 hours or 50 miles to get to their school where they work. You know, not that that school district wants to do that immediately, but just what are the possibilities of that? You know, of developing on our own land as opposed to buying land from a third party and trying to make a deal happen. I do know there's a couple of states out west that have d developed that affordable housing for new teachers that can live there only up to five years when they first work with them. 
and they have affordable housing. The idea that they save money below market rent that they go buy a house somewhere else or right. something. And I've seen that it's, that's out there right now. That's being used across the country. So can you share that with our staff and stuff like that? And that way we get this that's another possibility. So there before. there are two there are school two school districts in the state of Florida that have kind of started to go down this road and um, Miami Dade and Pinellas. And um, you know, I, I think it's really important to to allow to allow us to see the blueprint from soup to nuts. So then we don't end up in any sort of quagmire, because um, I, I want to make sure that if we do this, we do this correctly, and, and we do this being, we're, this there's good intent behind this, but it can quickly turn into um, something where number one, one group of employees feels marginalized versus another group of employees. We don't want that to happen. We want to make sure that um, that you know we cooperate with with the right real estate partner, the right developer, um, the right management firm over um, these types of facilities. You know, we're we're not you know a housing authority, so and I don't want us to get into that business. But I think that it's important for us to really react to the affordability problem that exists. So. I'm, I'm more than willing to continue studying this, utilizing, utilizing the districts here, and then utilizing districts that are out of state, um, and, and formulating the best plan possible, um, so then we can go ahead and, and, and not just take care of teachers, but we also have other, other employees in our district that um, really deserve the consideration for workforce housing as well. So that would be something that um, it's of interest to me. I know it's of interest to I, affordable housing for our employees is of interest to everybody. I've certainly had a lot of discussion around this with Mr. Melendez and uh, Mr. Callan, if, if you're open to it at, at a 40% discount, um, certainly would be willing to go ahead and discuss this further with you. Any discounts already baked in. <laughs> <laughs> Below the rack rate already. <laughs> uh, but I'll look into yeah. that. I'll get with Ron and Dave on. I, I think that that would be great if we can just start formulating some ideas yeah. and and start trying to put put some things together. That makes me super nervous because that is so outside of the scope. We it is. We we're, we are having trouble getting our kids to read on grade level. Right now, we're going to start building apartments. I think that that's such not our responsibility to do as elected officials it's our responsibility to use the land to the best capacity which right. would mean finding a partner the problem is that we're going to find the partner and i can already i guarantee you i can already tell you who those partners would end up being in Oslo county that's the problem uh -huh. so if we could make a fair process where we could make it advantageous for someone to come yeah. build the housing uh for our employees that's one thing but yeah. certainly it would not be it, it's it's I share your reluctance as well as uh, Dr. Shanoff's reluctance on this. Make sure that because the list of horribles hasn't come out yet about this. It's right. pretty, pretty relatively young. Right. But we'll look into what Pinellas is doing primarily. And Miami, Miami Day. Day. Yep. Miami Day. I'll look, we'll scout around out west to look at that. Okay? Yeah. And we'll bring it to the enforcement and all that. Maybe some benefits to it with teacher retention. Younger teachers, that kind of thing, would be helpful. But however, there's it was the, it's not it's a, it's a new concept, so you don't have you haven't heard the bad. Thing. But you're right; it's not our core business. Um, but if it can if it can help improve stability in for those that are the main drivers behind improving our outcomes, then there's definitely a connection. There. Well, we could sell our land and we could pay the teachers more. Well, we're gonna run out. at this time we have like five minutes left. Yeah. There's a notice years. that we have an interlocal agreement planning and public school concurrency workshop on April 9th. We do have on our agenda still today, Dr. Shanoff, naming procedures for new schools is listed yeah. there. I, are we going to have time for that at this point? So I don't know if we're going to have time for it. Um, Did they move this April point? 9th? I heard the concurrency was going to move to the 20th. Okay. Third. 20th. Okay. Okay. Request tonight that we move in. I think that was on my agenda for later, and I didn't. So I didn't we can definitely we can that. definitely add it April to the ninth. Um, looking at that, looking Dr. at that. Uh, I don't believe people that need to present K 
can do it on the 9th. No, no, no. It's noted in here. It's noted it's in for later it's today. It is the 23rd at 9 or at 3 p.m. Oh, okay. All right. Instead of April. Got it. Okay. That, so I mean, we can we can push this to the 23rd, and quite honestly, this is a much more entertaining um, topic than what was up there. School name. School name. School name was way more entertaining. <laughs> you were the best, this was, Dave. This yes, was of course. For me. So, Ms. Queen, everything will push as well as the concurrency agreement for the 23rd? Yes, so Whatever we'll do we're both on the 23rd if, it, if, it's, if it's okay with everybody, so then we can stay on schedule. Sounds good. At this time, this meeting is adjourned. We have five minutes until our next meeting for uh, budget update. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah.